sport as such teaches us a lot and sportsmen when we look at them we get so inspired by them because of the way they have overcome so many things in life to reach their ultimate goals but i have a theory in that if you're working around sport in whatever capacity you do need to have a sportsman like spirit a sports person like conduct and a sports person like attitude that takes you through to your dreams and joining me today is someone whom i've admired over the years whom i've shared a friendship with and he is someone who has those very qualities that i mentioned dean duplessy joins me all the way from zimbabwe how have you been dean it's so great to have you on my show uh, uh thank you very much indeed nishad i was very happy when you extended the invite it's it's always good to be on your show and uh, i'm well thank you uh in these strange circumstances we find ourselves i'm i'm healthy and i'm well and obviously very grateful for that before we move ahead i'd like you to introduce yourself to my audience because you know it's really i'd love to hear it from your own uh, from your own side in your own words well thank you very much nishad it's great to be on your show hello my name is dean duplessy i am a freelance cricket journalist reporter commentator presenter and analyst from harare zimbabwe um i have been blind since birth i had well, when i was born i had tumors behind both my retinas so i was given 3 to 5 months maximum to live and well somebody got it wrong because i'm 43 not out and and still going very very strong um yeah i i have a cricket podcast as well which i would very much like you to subscribe to um the name of the cricket podcast is called dean at stumps and the at is not the at sign it's actually at uh, and then stumps and this podcast is available on all the major podcast feeds or apps so in other words your apple podcast your spotify overcast downcast pocket cast any one of those even google as well you'll you'll see it there i've been very privileged over the lockdown period which has obviously been incredibly frustrating and worrying and and sad but i've been blessed because i've been able to interview the likes of david gower obviously fantastic uh, england cricketer and very well respected commentator what well, he used to be when he was a sky um uh, kumar sangakara which was fantastic talking to such a humble gentleman ab de villiers uh, um also graham hick fantastic batsman who never really made it at the top but even so was a wonderful wonderful cricketer for england and for worcestershire over the years Michael Hussey and there's many many more to come I can't quite think of all the names but Sean Pollock is there as well which was absolutely wonderful so there's some fantastic people who I've spoken to um and um yeah I mean I, I suppose my my ambition in life is to to live the dream and and to be privileged enough to travel the world as a cricket journalist and to be able to go to big test matches around the, around the world and, and be welcomed into the homes of many people in india and the subcontinent and to show the world that i am just as capable as a fully sighted journalist as well so you know but i've had some incredible fun along the way doing what i do it's it's really great i remember you telling me the story of how you fell in love with cricket and i should say india has got a small role to play in that because it happened when south africa made their comeback to international cricket can you tell me a bit about that because that series is also remembered very fondly here in this country yes ab absolutely well, india actually have a very big role to play in my progression as as a journalist not just a small role so they india actually introduced me personally to the game of cricket now my older brother was a a fine cricketer and um you know obviously played very well but i because i didn't understand the game i didn't actually follow it or like it um and how i got introduced to the game it was a it, it was a afternoon i am sure it was a thursday afternoon in around about november of 1991 it was the third and final one day international played between india and south africa of course india having already won the series posted a very big total well, well let's put it that way in those days it was a very big total 287 for 5 so back in the days radio commentary was really you know it wasn't as clear as what is as what it is now so Uh, the the satellite radio that they would have used and communications wasn't particularly good in those days so i i just heard this astonishing sound of the continuous fireworks it erupt, erupting and exploding and 
and the chanting and, and the cheering of the Indian supporters. And somewhere amongst that, I've vaguely heard a commentator's voice in the background. But, you know, the noise initially got me hooked. And, you know, then I, I, then I was able to actually listen to the way that uh, Peter Kirsten and Kepler Vessels and Adrian Caper set up that incredible run chase for South Africa. Um, you know, so th that was how I, how I started to understand the game of cricket. And then I obviously completely fell in love with the game in 1992 with, in my opinion, what is still 28 years down the line, the best World Cup. And, and that was the 92 World Cup. I say it's the best World Cup because you had nine teams playing each other. Now, that obviously was a bit of a setback because you want the, the growth of cricket to, you know, to always um, strengthen them and you want more teams to be playing. But what we found in a scenario like that was that every single team had a win. You know, we saw obviously Sri Lanka beating Zimbabwe in a, in a very high run chase. And then we saw Sri Lanka beat South Africa in a low scoring game. And that was just magnificent the way that they went about that. And then of course, from a Zimbabwean perspective, they beat England, England who were the favorites to win the World Cup. And um, a little bit of complacency and a, and a tricky wicket, Zimbabwe took full advantage of and, and beat England. So to me, I, I still remember the 1992 World Cup better than what I actually remember last year's World Cup, believe it or not. <laughs> but then uh, that was the start. But at what stage did it inspire you to start writing about the game and talking about the game? And how did you pick up the skills to read the game and to understand the game? Um, I, I mean, I started messing around with, with pretending to be a commentator when I was at school. You know, so as opposed to, you know, you should, I should really have been studying for a, a, a geography exam or, you know, any one of those exams that you do at school. Um, I, I really wasn't academically inclined at all uh, at school. I knew from the very beginning that I wanted to be on radio, but I didn't at the time realize that, I, that cricket would, would play such a, an important part of my life. So... When I started to understand the game and, and love the game, I, I started to do mock commentary. So because I did my schooling in South Africa, but still in Zimbabwe, I, it was always these make-up test matches between South Africa and Zimbabwe. Now, in reality, if South Africa were to play Zimbabwe, uh, the test match wouldn't probably have lasted longer than, than two days, you know, with, uh, with, with the firepower that they had. in when I, when I was at school, the bowling attack would have been Alan Donald, Brett Schultz, Craig Matthews, Farney De Villiers, Brian McMillan, you know, maybe a little bit of Clive Eckstein or Pat Simcox, depending on... They, they probably even wouldn't have picked a spinner to play Zimbabwe. They would have gone in with a, with a four-pronged pace attack, probably. Um, and anyway, I used to do this, this mock commentary at school. So it would go something on the lines of, away runs big Edo Brandis now, passed on by Steve Dunn from New Zealand, gets in and bowls two Kepler vessels. Oh, he's bowled him! You know, or it would always be a South African being being taken out by a Zimbabwean because that was the only way it was going. It was never really going to happen in a Test match, and and then and then so a lot of my schoolmates encouraged me, you know. But it was actually my late house father who said, you know, Dean, you you haven't really impressed us with the way that you conduct yourself at school in terms of of academics, but maybe this is something you should do and try and pursue. You know, maybe try and, and listen to how r r people go about doing their, their radio reports and, and try and do that when you get back home to your beloved Zimbabwe. And I did, but it wasn't until 2001 when I was given the opportunity to actually prove myself. But, you know, stump microphones are very important to me as well, Nishat. So um, when I'm listening to a game of cricket, be it on television or on radio, lots of times I'm able to tell you who the bowler is by... Uh, thanks to the stump microphones. So, for example, in the current setup, Stuart Broad, as he's got older, you know, he's he gives more and more of a grunt as he gets to the to the wicket. You know, because obviously it, it's quite a. I mean, it's always a strain running in and bowling, whether you're 25 or 35. So Broad, quite a big, tall unit, obviously has to put in a lot of effort when he gets to the crease. So there's that big grunt. Um, Kuldeep Yadav as well. If you hear him bowl. You know, he, he also puts in quite a bit of effort being a, a wrist spinner. Shane Warne, uh, because he had so much upper body um, strength. And also, as you know, leg spinners, I suppose, rely more on upper body 
strength as opposed to the, your finger spinner who just basically trots in and, and relies more on what they do with, with their fingers. I mean, I'm sure leg spinners do as well, certainly. But a wrist spinner, obviously, as you know, is more upper body. So a lot of shoulder goes into it, a lot of hip rotation goes into it. And of course, your wrist and your fingers as well. So stump microphones are very important because I can tell when it's a slower delivery in, in a sense, the way that when the ball leaves the bat and, you know, the time it takes to hit either the, the pad or the stumps or the bat. Um, and even batting as well. Uh, lots of cricketers uh, have their own little, um, I suppose, their little habits that they do. When, so certain batsmen, when, when they hook or they pull, they give a bit of a grunt. And, and Marcus Treskosik and Andrew Strauss, they were a dream for me to listen to because when they batted together, when they had the very successful uh, opening, par opening partnership over the years, when Treskosik hit the ball, he would always go, run, you know? And then when Strauss hit the ball, he would always say, yeah, come on, come on, come on. So it was, it was a real dream. Kevin Peterson used to give quite a grunt when he hooked or pulled, as did Graham Smith as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, they're just, they're, everybody has a little, so the Australians have this saying, they always say, wait, and then they say, not now, you know, but they'll also say, wait on. And that's pretty much how I do what I do, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty, pretty great. Dean, you just mentioned the way you identify bowlers, batsmen, and how do you identify shots? Because like a cover drive, does it sound different from, say, a square cut or a pull shot? Because... For, for us, it's just a proper cracking sound of the bat. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, look, definitely certain shots have a, have a different sound to it. So you can always tell, tell, or I can certainly tell, and I'm sure many other blind, visually impaired people can do the same as well, um, is you can tell when it's, a, when it's a, the full, a fuller pitch delivery because it's more of a, it's a bit more muffled, you know, there's a bit more of a meaty sound to to the to the shot when it comes off the bat so when he's been driven straight down the ground you, you the, there's more of a meaty sound whereas when a ball is short and it's it's cut or it's pulled there's definitely more of a crack sound like that you know to when the ball comes off the bat it's a sharper sound as opposed to when the ball is pitched up it's a slightly more um muffled but at the same time it well, let's compare it to a sound system. So when, when, a, when a straight drive or a cover drive is played, there's more bass to the sound system as opposed to when a cut shot is played, that's when your, your treble speakers, the, the treble comes in into the sound system, if I can put it to you that way. And I'd also want our viewers to know the story of how you got into the commentary box for the first time because I remember you telling me that story and I think Neil Manthorpe also had something to do with it. Can you narrate yes. that incident, please? Yeah, absolutely, so Very much so. It, it, was a, it was a triangular series back in 2001. It, was, it featured Zimbabwe, the hosts, India and the West Indies. Oh, yes. And it was we so nice, Nisha. Because... Because... <laughs> we remember that series. <laughs> This particular game, that I, it was the very first game of the Triangular Series. It was Zimbabwe versus the West Indies. And a lot of people had got to know me in the, the press box, which in those days was just this big, ugly old scaffolding. It wasn't the nice media center that we have now. But it brings back good memories, you know, because a, a lot of good things happened there for me. So I would wander into the TV box and listen to Ravi Shastri and Harsha Bogri and uh, Tony Cozier would have been there as well. Dave Houghton, Andy Pycroft was there. And then I'd wander out again. And then the next thing, I heard a voice and I thought, goodness me, this can't be. And it was Neil Manthorpe. So obviously Neil goes back many, many years for me because I came across him um, at Cape Town uh, when I was at school in, in Cape Town or just outside Cape Town. And he used to do the ball by ball commentary from Newlands in Cape Town, when Western Province, it was then known as Western Province, were playing their, their matches there. And I, I had a bit of a listen, and I realized these guys are doing ball-by-ball -ball radio commentary. So I politely tapped on the door when there was a bit of a break, and they welcomed me in with open arms. There was Neil Manthorpe, there was um, a, an analyst from India, and his name was also Ashish, who was very kind to me. Um, Marcus Pryor, Craig Ray, and, and all of these people were there. And we started talking and, and Neil said, but I recognize you now, where do I know you from? And um, he remembered or he recognized me because the week before that, Ravi Shastri had interviewed me 
at a tea break during the second and final test match between Zimbabwe and India, which, in, which Zimbabwe won by four wickets um, and to level the series at one test match each. And Neil actually said, gosh, you know what? I would like to have you as a guest. So I can't do anything today because all my guests are lined up. Colin Croft, the waffle former West Indies bowler, was there as well. So the next day, it was Zimbabwe versus India. And it was a real horror show for Zimbabwe because they were bundled out for practically nothing. And, and uh, India chased down the total for the loss of just one wicket. But that was when I made my debut. And initially, the Crick Info people back in London were incredibly afraid of having a totally blind person in the commentary box. So what they initially said to Neil Manthorpe was, look, just give him 15 minutes and then make sure he disappears. But then before the 15 minutes were up, they communicated with Neil and said, Keep him on for the full 30 minutes. Make sure he's a part of the higher trialist series as well. And, um, you know, many people thought that I was destined now for, for greatness because of the fact that I was doing ball-by-ball ball commentary. Well, I was more of an analyst, as obviously, as opposed to a commentator. Um, but it didn't really, ha you know, nothing really materialized. A lot of people knew who I was and congratulated me, but that was as far as it went. And then I made my television debut. Um, also at Queen Sports Club in, in down in, in Bulawayo two years la later when Zimbabwe were hosting the West Indies. And it was quite special because I made my debut as a television uh, commentator and Zimbabwe actually beat the West Indies by five wickets. So it's really special. Yeah, it's, it's really great. And over the years, you've done many of these uh, matches, covered a lot of them. Who are the players who have left very good memories for you? Maybe talk about your first series where you would have heard, like, what did Sachin Tendulkar, like, you know, what was your impression of him? Or a sort of Ganguly, or some of the Indian blokes, or even from the West Indies, like you mentioned, Chris Gale, Wavell Hines. I'm sure Carl Hooper was also on that trip. Oh, yes, he was. Yes, Carl Hooper. Carl Hooper was, at that particular time, arguably my favourite West Indies, if not my favourite player in the world. You know, the way that... That, that Hooper manipulated the strike, the way that he used his feet, especially against the left arm spinners, was sensational. You know, he was a good slip fielder, a decent off spinner. Um, so, uh, I, so Hooper was my, my favorite player. I, I know that many people didn't rate him as a captain. I don't think a lot of people got on with him, but just as a player, gosh, he was, uh, he was a superb player. Now, Sachin Tunduka, I actually had the privilege of witnessing Tunduka score two hundreds in Zimbabwe. The first, when I was way before I was a journalist, just as a, as a fan back in 1980, he scored a wonderful hundred at Queen Sports Club in Bulawayo. This was the first of three one day internationals. So Zimbabwe batted first initially, got off to a very good start and then lost their way badly. Alistair Campbell got a 50 and then threw his wicket away. Um, and then there was a bit of a revival, but Sachin just make the bow, made the bowling look very ordinary as he did with many bowling attacks around the world and scored a sensational 100 uh, for Zimbabwe to be beaten, comprehensively beaten. Um, and then I saw him do it again three years later. Now, this is just as I was beginning to make my mark, I suppose, as a, as a journalist. Um, and that was against the West Indies. So the West Indies batted first and got a decent enough total. But um, Ganguly and Tunduka, in chasing that, it was one of, it was one of the... The round-robin games, I suppose you could. In fact, it was a dead rubber game already. Zimbabwe were out of the, the equation because they didn't play particularly good cricket in that series, I'm afraid. Not at all. And, and Tendulkar and Ganguly were up against the West Indies. And it was superb. You know, and, and I had the great joy of Harsha Bogley from a television perspective telling me what he was doing. And then a, a, a name that many people may have forgotten about, I hope not, because he was a very good radio commentator by the name of Andrew Mason. Um, who worked for, who was a Caribbean commentator in the West Indies. And he was just wonderful, absolutely wonderful in the way that um, he described Tendulka rotating the strike and, and, and you know, just Ganguly whipping balls off his pads continuously because the West Indies bowled on his pads and Tendulka playing through the covers. And I remember them describing when Tendulka scored his winning runs and India were walking off the field it was a dress rehearsal for the final, really. And one of the West Indian players, I, I don't recall who, actually came and carried Tendulkar's bat. And, you know, just those little intricacies. So, live, I've seen Tendulkar score 200s. Um, 
but I've also obviously on television listened to him score some uh, pretty special innings as well. You know, I certainly remember a double hundred against Zimbabwe, which was very special and, and, and a very, very good hundred that he scored against Australia in 2008 in Australia was just magnificent. But from a, from a journalistic perspective and people who I've been or who I've been close enough to watch uh, entertain, I remember a, a breathtaking hundred that Brian Lara scored against Zimbabwe in the second One Day International at, in fact, the first, the first One Day International at Queen's Sport Club in 2003. You know, he was, he was superb. He was absolutely magnificent. Um, and um, like I said, Ashish Nira gave me a lot of joy in the way that he went about bowling in Zimbabwe. He, he understood the conditions perfectly because it was just enough to keep the seamers interested. That series that was played between Zimbabwe and, and the West Indies and India was in Zimbabwe's winter. So the games would start half an hour early. And although it didn't rain, but there was just a bit of moisture in the pitch and, and the overhead conditions were, were wonderful for seam bowling. And Ashish Nira, in my opinion, was comfortably the pick of the bunch consistently throughout that, that series.